can see that in the future and that would be the reason behind that. So real quick, I'm just gonna provide an update as to some stats as it relates to the Los Paseos uh, Neighborhood Association and then open it up to any questions you might have. So what I did is I pulled uh, some stats for the months of February, March, April of this year and then also compared them to last year. Um, and so for the three month period this year, we had 12 reported crimes in the Los Paseos neighborhood and I'm gonna break those down for you. Um, just in comparison in 2019 last year, we had 11 reported crimes. Um, so it, it went up by one, but if you look at the nature of the crimes, I think we've seen a slight improvement. So last year this time we had a carjacking, a narcotic arrest and a branching of a weapon. Um, so again, that was in 2019 for the same period of time. But this year, what we had were six stolen vehicles, uh, two commercial burglaries with force, two residential burglaries with force, meaning that they forced entry. It wasn't through an unlocked door. Uh, one auto burglary and then a petty theft from a building. So for the six stolen vehicles, I'm going to give you just kind of the main areas because I do look at where they occurred. And that's going to be on the 100 block of Burnell Road, Cheltenham Way, Avenida Espana, and I think it's called Manal Court, M-E-N-A-U-L Court. Again, those were the six stolen vehicles. The two commercial burglaries were along Santa Teresa Boulevard. So during COVID, the shelter in place, um, division wide and really citywide, the residential burgs went down and commercial burglaries went up, obviously, because the businesses are vacant. So the two that we did have were on Santa Teresa, which is very common throughout the division. The commercial burglaries have been on Blossom Hill, Santa Teresa. Um, the two residentials were on Pawtucket Way and Farnham Court. The auto burglary, which means somebody broke into a car and stole less than $950 worth of property, uh, occurred on Chantilly Lane. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to remind everybody of the, uh, what we call the remove it or lose it campaign. And I think I talked about that at the very first D2 meeting, um, leadership council meeting. And again, that's just a crime prevention tip to remove valuables from your vehicle so they don't get stolen. Um, and then that petty theft that I told you about, that happened on the 100 block of Burnell Road. So the petty theft and the stolen vehicles, I guess Burnell Road out there got hit. So if we look at the 12 reported crimes for that time period, and we look at the same time period on proactivity uh, for officers, we're actually looking at 99, which is a really high number, 99 proactive enforcement, what I call touches. A touch could be a, a patrol check, a premise check, something where the officers are self-initiating with their free proactive patrol time, generating a case number. So that would also include pedestrian stops, car stops, on view suspicious vehicles, people flagging down officers to report crimes. So for that three month period to have 99 touches is really high. Last year we had 49. So it almost doubled the amount of uh, proactivity for that time period, which is really great. And uh, some of the highlights of those 99 touches were um, two physical arrests, 12 citations, and a lot of the enforcement were concentrated in Los Paseos Park, Avenida Espana, and obviously you're gonna see the correlation between where the crimes occur and where officers spend their time, right? Uh, San Ignacio and Bernal, Avenida Rotella and Via Serena, Monterey and Bernal, Santa Teresa Boulevard, Pegasus Way, Farnham Court and Pawtucket Way. So the officers again are spending their proactive time in those areas. Um, that is my report and just wanna open up to any questions that people might have. I see a question. Oh, I see a question on the chat from Tony. Uh, how many of those crimes were solved? Um, I would have to dive into the stats off the top of my head. I don't have those reports. Um, I can speak anecdotally that petty theft from a building and stolen vehicles and someone breaking into a car, oftentimes we don't have the resources to solve those and if we do solve them it's going to be because somebody gets captured in the stolen vehicle or um, there's dna that might come back there's a higher likelihood that we might solve a commercial or residential burglary if it's a string if they get caught in the act or leave in the area um but it's just it, it's it's too time consuming for me to drill down into that for every single crime so i don't have that in my report unfortunately is there a way to get that captain l somehow that we could get it? 
you know, you'd have to make a public records request through the crime analysis unit or the records unit. And if there was one, uh, it would have to be something exceptional because if I set a new precedent, I'm going to be doing that at every neighborhood association meeting. Right. And it's just too, right. too, too labor intensive no. uh, as I'm responsible for 275,000 people. Um, so if that said, if there was a string or a hotspot or a real concern or problem, something extraordinary, and I knew in advance, then I could look into that much like the follow-up question from Monday night's meeting. Somebody had a question about the carjacking, like where did that happen? And I get it, that's a real concern. A carjacking is a very violent crime. So I did take the time offline to look into that and report back via email. Uh, so it won't be part of my normal report unless it's something like a rape, a homicide, uh, maybe a carjacking, something that's extraordinary, then I'll take the time to do that. But it's just, I don't have the time to do it for okay. everything. Well, Tony, um, maybe uh, you and I can work together and figure out how we can get that answer to your question. And I'll put that down as uh, something I can talk to you about later. I have a wait, question. Uh, wait, wait. Um, another, uh, uh, sorry. Um, you know, what, what we'd like is if you either chat, do you use the chat function to do your question or raise your hand? So that way I can kind of go through and monitor and, and call on people in an orderly fashion. So Alaire Davidson has a question through chat. How many officers slash community service uh, people are available per shift in our area? Sure, so uh, we have three shifts per day, day swings and mids, and on average, we have anywhere from four to six police officers for the entire district. Um, and typically one community service officer. Uh, they don't respond to enforcement related crime, you know, uh, they go to cold calls and they collect fingerprints and things like that. So they definitely take police reports, but not where there's any suspects still present. Um, and typically on a priority call, we're sending two officers per call at a time. So at any given time, we can handle two to three calls at a time. Um, depending on the day of the week and the shift, we may have multiple calls pending. Um, so those are kind of our numbers. And David Net Net Netemeyer is asking, how do you believe the current proposed budget cuts to SJPD will impact the ability to respond to petty crimes and nonviolent crimes? Right. Hi, David. Um, so the proposed budget cuts that we have are in, in response to the pandemic. Um, we as a city, I understand, are looking to get reimbursed through federal monies, FEMA, for example. So the budget that the uh, city manager put forth was a proposed budget um, in anticipation. We have to kind of plan for a rainy day, right? We have to plan for not getting any money back. So we hope to get some of those monies back. Oh, she froze. She froze. City manager's report on page 13, it had public safety cuts, one of which is to the community service officer program. So we currently have 10 vacancies uh, at the rank of community service officer. And again, that's the non-enforcement um, officer that we have one per team right now. Um, so we currently have those 10 vacancies that they have eliminated. So we're not gonna be backfilling those positions. Um, so as far as, you know, the other, as it relates to petty crimes and nonviolent crimes, we do not have, at least at the, at the chief's level, the discussions I've been a part of, any discussion about eliminating uh, response to petty crimes. I mean, we are not going to um, do any layoffs, right? There's no discussion. So if you look at just the proactivity that we had, we should be able to maintain that as a status quo. Certainly there's an ebb and flow with crime rates. So in the summer, summer months, things heat up and we're more reactive and responding to calls for service. But every shift is gonna have some measure of proactive patrol time. So I don't really see our service model in short changing in our response to petty crimes or nonviolent crimes. Um, again, if anything, we just adapt from quarter to quarter with an uptick in crime based on weather and, and things like that.
All right. All so right. we have well, a thanks. we have another question. Sorry, uh, Greg. We have another quest, question via the chat from Herb Bowen. Uh, Yellow District is the largest area. We are having people targeting cars in the early morning. Can we get coverage in our neighborhood? We do the best that we can. Um, as you can imagine, every neighborhood association asks me the exact same thing, but I don't have any additional resources. So we are um, a stat driven kind of department at times. Um, I know right now our midnight resources, we have some directive from the top to address the commercial burglary crime rate. So I know our midnight officers are very much um, activated and working on that. And they have been highly successful in apprehending some of the suspects that are um, you know, driving cars into commercial businesses and, and just uh, wreaking havoc in the Southern Division. So uh, short answer is we'll do our best. I can't guarantee I'm going to be able to put extra resources in that area in that time of day, but it is, you know, timely intelligence. Oh. And I'll certainly pass it on to you. Can I follow up? Mm -hmm. So El, um, just I went past Monterey and you talk about chop shops. I saw a van with probably about 16 tires on the top of it. Oh, on Monterey, so I don't know who's doing that in a bunch of parts. So uh, it's kind of like, okay, they wanted to do everything on one van and throw it all up on the top of it. But uh, I think there is somebody working in our area for doing, you know, car stuff. So yeah, and to her, or not, excuse me, her, but um, to Greg's point earlier, there are some added resources looking at that, particularly uh, with the video surveillance that exists in your neighborhood. And so, um, in, in those assets are the ones that are going to be more successful in apprehending it. I mean, I could do my best to get my six officers driving, you know, the Southern division, um, but it's a quarter of the city, 180 square miles. So it gets very diluted. So we do the best we can, but you know, if you stand outside and count how many times you're driving through your neighborhood on any given night, right? Sometimes yeah. it may not be well, at all. And that's just the Captain, reality. Captain, I saw a police officer drive down my court the other day and I stopped Good. and talked to him. He was, uh, he told me that, uh, he, whenever he can, he's going to be driving through the neighborhoods down here, and uh, he was pretty help, helpful. So you guys are, your people are roaming around our neighborhood, and we appreciate that. So yeah, and they do. You know, it's just for me, I'm always very um, cautious because I like to temper expectations. I don't want to make false promises, you know, at the yeah. same time, 99 touches. And your neighborhood association alone is extremely high. For all of Foothill Division, they had like a 1,000 for a three month period. And we have 10% of that in just your neighborhood association alone. So for you to really appreciate the proactivity in a very small geographic area, you're already getting a high level of service. Yes, um, I, and when I came into this division, I sent the officers out into the parks, into the schools to have high visibility. And, and there's a lot of citizens that'll come up to officers and they're like, oh, we're, you know, and then they'll say, hey, our new captain wants us out here. And so they know those are my expectations and we're going to absolutely get out there as, you know, as much as humanly possible. So. All right. Well, so, thanks a lot, Captain, for your wait, update. Wait, wait, wait. Can, oh. can we ask one more question? So um, I know uh, I, I was on the NLC meeting and you kind of spoke to this topic, but I know there's some people on this call that are um, wanting the, the same question answered as far as how you, how do you think the, the new bridge house or interim emergency interim housing um, locations will impact crime in our area? Well, you know, I think it's one of those things, uh, time will tell. Um, it's an area, you know, right now what we have are, I get daily complaints about homeless encampments um, because people are, are already living throughout the division or throughout the city, right? Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to relocate some people to housing where they have security, where they have rules, right, where they have some measure of cleanliness. So it's, it's an issue that exists throughout the city already, and we're trying to do something about it, right? Um, as far as crime spikes and crime going up, I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I think if anything, you, you put a class of people who are otherwise unhoused, right, without on-site security, and you put them into an area where we have security, right, and we have open lines of communication between the city and the police department, I don't necessarily see that as a recipe for a disaster. I mean, um, we're just going to have to wait and see, see what happens with it. I, it's something that needs to happen, and what you have to understand from my perspective, it's frustrating because I, I get a lot of people that literally have homeless encampments almost in their backyard, right? They email me about the trash and the debris and the fires that are taking place. Um, at the same time, you get people that don't want bridge housing in their backyard, right? And it's like, well, the unhoused live 
they're, they're residents of San Jose, right? And it's equal protection under the law, whether you're housed or unhoused. So I have an obligation and responsibility to protect the people that need housing as much as the, the residents that pay taxes in the city of San Jose. So where I come from, right, it's equal protection under the law. Um, I'm, it's kind of like uh, Council Member Jimenez said, you know, we just have to wait and see. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to have a positive correlation for an increase in crime. I think we just need to, we need to wait it out and see what happens, but it's going to be at least organized. It's not like a rogue camp, you know, like Santa Cruz had, um, where, where there's nothing. I mean, there's going to, there's, there's rules there. Right. And so we're going to make sure that the city enforces those rules, right. We as a, as a community and then the police department will do their part. Thank you. And a final question, Herb uh, is asking, what is the cost of a part-time PD resource for five hours on swing shift to cover around the area? Well, we gotta um, go get you some money. <laughs> no, don't, don't laugh at me. Yeah. I, I don't know, I mean, money. the cost of a part-time. So what I'm looking at is, is and I talked to Sergio about this, uh -huh. is that it, you know these people are gonna be done with their program at five o'clock and then they, they're locked down at 10. And during that time, they can go to the store and that whole area will oh, be. Right. So I'm looking, you know, let's, if we have to pay an officer to stay on shift, could we do that? And what's the monthly cost of doing it? Uh, you you'd have to get the rate from the secondary employment unit. That would be managed through them. Okay. And you can send me in whoever I can contact about that. Uh, yeah, or? just send me an email or have Greg send me an email or you can, you can look it up sgpd.org. It's secondary employment unit, SEU. They have a public line. Okay. And what's the hourly rate usually with that? Over a hundred? Uh, I don't know. It's a slightest it's job. It's a long Perfect. time since I paid attention to that. All right. I'll contact them. Greg and I will. All yeah, right. I, I don't think it's over a hundred. Thank right. you. But thank you very much. We appreciate your time. You're welcome. Very much. Thank you, Kathleen. So next on the agenda is uh, we'll give some LPNA business update. Uh, the first one is Barbara is National Night Out this year. Um, last year we had 500 people show up uh, at our event over in the park. So Barbara's got some update for that. Yeah, uh, 500 people in the park. <laughs> Not, that's probably going to happen. <laughs> I mean, we've been planning for our usual National Night Out, and, and as Greg said, we've had. For two years running, we've had about 500 people. It's been a great event. But with the restrictions on large gatherings and just prudence, um, the, the National Night Out, certainly in its, in its uh, uh, prior form, won't happen. And it, it it's, won't happen on August 4th. The National Organization for National Night Out has suggested an alternate date in October. But that comes with issues. It's, it'll, the weather won't be as, well, as good. It'll get dark sooner. Um, and I contacted the Parks Department and I was referred actually to the San Jose Police Department. Their community outreach uh, group uh, is actually responsible for um, uh, coordinating the Police Department participation in National Night Out. And they are actually the city sponsors of National Night Out. And they've said they are not able to, to give a date when or if they will be able to support National Night Out at all. Uh, this year. So uh, at the moment, uh, it, it is um, very much up in the air whether whether or not it will happen, which is unfortunate, but hopefully uh, if it doesn't happen this year, we will have a, a bang up next year. Yeah. Thanks, Barbara. Um, next, uh, we wanted to talk about a CERT program that uh, Barbara and Herb and few other people in the neighborhood are trying to introduce to our neighborhood. So go ahead, Barb and Herb. So, uh, you know, yeah, Herb's going to do this one. <laughs> okay. You want to do that? You, who wants to do it? It doesn't matter to me. Go ahead, Herb. But just a, a follow up on the park thing. Dan Greeley is no longer our park supervisor. Uh, it's Adriel Castro now. So just so people know, you can call Adriel for our park issues. Okay, okay on CERT. Uh, I took the CERT class last year. Uh, with the city uh, for D2. There was a few other people that took it with us, Wyman and another lady, uh, Nuria, out of the area. And my goal here is to try to get more people to attend this and build up a group um, for people that, uh, you know, want to be involved in helping out in the community. So go to the next slide. 
Uh, okay, so what CERT does is educate volunteers about disaster preparedness. Um, so I have to move this over. Uh, for hazards that may impact their area, CERT uh, team are activated by the Office of Emergency Services. So that's San Jose's office, and usually they'll cover us and they provide uh, insurance when you do this too. So it's kind of nice you get sworn in. Uh, the, the thing is they expect some stuff out of you to do this. And in, in part with that is the CERT members are trained in basic disaster response skills, fire safety and suppression, basically how to put out a fire, uh, light search and rescue to go into homes when maybe there's an earthquake or problems that you need to go in and, and check or rescue a person. Uh, the team organization of CERT uh, builds up uh, really command areas that they would set up for CERT, you know, for trauma issues, uh, first aid, uh, just a meeting area. So part of that is, is training us in how to control uh, our area and manage it. Uh, the third part is disaster medical operations. Now, that's limited for us. You know, some of us have more medical uh, training or first aid instructors or uh, but in this case they give you the basics of how to you know stop bleeding and it's, it's good to know because if it happens to you in your home and your family you're prepared so let's go to the next slide please so CERT offers a, a consistent nationwide approach to volunteer training and an organization of professional responders that can rely on during disaster situations so San Jose is set up, and like last year, I told you, District 2 did a training. It consists of two weekends, uh, book training, and then actual doing stuff. So you learn how to crib, you know how to put out a fire, search a, a residence. Uh, so it, it, was, um, it was really interesting to do it. So, uh, you know, I mean, it takes a little time here to do it, but uh, if you're interested, uh, you know, they're gonna do another training in September. And they provide course materials, basic supplies, helmets, goggles, the whole bit. So you're prepared, even first aid equipment. And it's free to our residents and individuals who work in San Jose. So, you know, if you're interested, uh, I don't know if we got the last slide there. Uh, okay, let me do this slide first, then I'll go to the last slide. Work with our neighborhood to implement CERT. Now that's what I'm trying to do uh, in this neighborhood. So we are covered, I just received a grant that I put in for uh, through Sergio's office in D2. So I got some money and part of that, uh, you know, will be to help to support this and developing street level organizations similar to Neighborhood Watch, which, you know, know your neighbors on your street is my approach here. So if something does happen, whether it's, you know, security related, you know, emergency that you're prepared, you know, Joe's on vacation or, oh, well, I have a senior here that I need to go and check on. So th that's my approach with the, um, the street level. And I'll, I'll provide some more detail to that in the future. Um, and we're accessing neighborhood resources. That's people and equipment. You know, you'd be surprised what people have, chainsaws and other things in their garage or it could help you during an emergency. Uh, so that, that's kind of leveraging our street level organization to see what we have. Uh, in turn, we started, we purchased some handheld radios so we can communicate throughout the Los Paseos neighborhood. Um, and we've tested that. Some of us are ham radio operators, so that helped also. So hey, we uh, Herb, down here in Herb, a dead zone. Go ahead. Herb, can I butt in for a second? Sure. We, we, we did test those and uh, they worked from Sheltonham over here all the way over to Avenida Grande so far. So that we're trying to spread them throughout the neighborhoods and we'll be, and that's what you'll be working on. So I right. wanted to throw that in. They, they work pretty neat. Right. So, so we would have extras for, you know, people that would go out and sort do search and rescue and that type of thing throughout the neighborhood. All right. So in our case, we already have a grant. So we were lucky to get our hands on the money and it hopefully we'll get it in the next month or so too. And so like in there, there's another class they're saying September, it might be online and maybe one day of training. Uh, actual hands-on. We'll see how they run it out of the EOC. Um, you can contact me if you're interested. My email's there. Also, Laura Wynn is our contact in the D2 office. If you'd like to go to those classes, you can contact either one of us. Uh, one last resource I'd like uh, to go to, and Greg's going to probably go to ready.gov.
What do you want? Well, I guess it won't go there. Anyway, ready.gov is FEMA's site for doing planning uh, as a family, uh, evacuation plans, just uh, games with the kids. So it's a really good resource for people to uh, investigate, especially if you're sitting home now and want projects to do with the kids. And uh, it, it just gives a lot of information about pandemics, uh, earthquakes, and different uh, uh, disasters that could happen to us. So I'd, uh, oh, there it is. So you can, um, I encourage you to, you have some time with the, your family to go through this, uh, make a plan. Uh, there's a lot of resources here, even a kids section. So, uh, you know, build a kit. All this kind of stuff is uh, all stuff pertinent to what we need to do for our community uh, during these different types of disasters of sorts. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. Okay. Any questions for Herb right now and anybody that would like to join in with this uh, process down the road, it's not gonna happen overnight, but we, we could use a little bit of help and some discussion if you'd like to contact Herb here at his email address. All right, Herb, thanks. All right, thanks, I gotta take off, appreciate it. All right. So that's the CERT presentation. No questions. Uh, there's six chats going there. Karen, is there anything in there? Karen? Karen has disappeared. Hold on a second, please. Uh, we did, we did have I'm a- here. I'm here. Um, so Alaire Davis mentioned that she'd registered for CERT class, but wound up traveling um, for work. Her husband and she and her husband are certified for first responder, responders, um, support staff for Spring Valley Fire Department as large animal rescue and first aid CPR. And they would both be interested in attending the training if they hold it again. So they're good resources for us to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, this is Barbara, I'll, I'll get in touch. Any, anything else there, Karen? No raised hands and no other chats. All right. Thank you all. Uh, Vanessa, you still here? Yes, I am. I'm here. Thank you. Hello. Uh, you want me to just go ahead and jump in? Sure. Sure. Let me change so the screen here. <laughs> So um, as Greg puts up some pictures for us, my name is Vanessa Sandoval and I'm Chief of Staff for Council Member Sergio Jimenez. Um, and I'll be providing an update um, to Los Paseos Neighborhood Association. And um, we wanted to start off with uh, bridge housing. First of all, thank you very much, Captain Washburn, for your um, very well stated answer to the question about increased crime around um, low income and interim housing. Um, to date, we do not have any anecdotal or statistical information that these developments increase crime in neighborhoods. That's obviously a good thing. And the intent of the city is to manage these uh, sites well and to make sure that those that are living in the bridge housing communities, as well as the neighboring communities are safe and that we're successful in housing people and getting people um, into stable housing. Um, so just a quick update, uh, Bernal, the Bernal site, which is on Bonner, uh, Mar, um, Monterey Road and Bernal Road. As many of you have seen, there is um, some movement underway. There's um, some construction has begun there. The intent is that the site will be fully developed um, within the next coming weeks. Um, and what we do know from the most recent information from the city manager's office is that a request for a proposal for an operator has gone out and that will um, that request will close on May 26th. So we're hoping that we get some good responses and that we have an operator by the end of May, early June. Um, most of the questions that we've received regarding the Monterey Bernal site uh, can be answered by visiting the uh, FAQs. So the city manager's office put out a series of frequently asked questions, uh, which you can find on the housing department's website. 
You can also find a link in our newsletter. I hope everyone who's on the call is signed up for our listserv and receiving our newsletter. That is our uh, most formal way of communication with our constituents. And so if you take a look at the newsletter, you will see a link not only to the frequently asked questions, which um, answer questions specifically about Monterey Bernal and some general questions about Ruferari. You'll also see the link to the Zoom meeting, which was hosted by the mayor a couple of weeks ago, um, where some questions were asked and where a presentation was made on the site development. Um, okay, I just want to but in here. I just want everybody to know that I, I started the recording here a while ago. So I'm recording this for possibly putting into our website. Thank you, Vanessa. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no problem. Um, and as also as you can see on the screen, Greg has up the site map um, that was made available by the city manager's office. So that is the most up to date and detailed information that we have. If you have any uh, questions, I really encourage everyone to visit the housing department's website and to take a look at those FAQs. Yes, some of the questions um, are answered in sort of broad strokes or very general information, but that is because that is the state of development in which we're at and as more information becomes available the FAQs will be updated periodically. Um, just a quick update on Rue Ferrari in our newsletter for those of you who had a chance to look at it. Um, this site is in the very early stages of development. Um, as of May 1st there was an RFP that went out um, on May 14th which is actually today. The city is scheduled to select um, a the most advantageous proposal as a result of the RFP that went out on May 1st. I don't have an update as of today, but we're hoping that maybe next week we'll have an update on how those um, who responded to the proposals and, and who the city decides to contract for the building of the site. Um, and by May 21st, the intent is to initiate a notice to proceed and begin the initial site construction activities. And the goal is to complete the site by July 24th. And at that point in time, end of July, begin um, interim housing. As more information becomes available on this site, we will also provide that to you. And we have asked the city manager's office to do a separate FAQ specifically for the Rue Ferrari site. And they have told us that they're working on it and they're gonna try and get as much up-to-date and current information out to the community as soon as possible uh, once it's made available. And with that said, I guess I could, do you want me to just finish with all of my updates? Greg, or did you want to jump into questions? Um, yes, I'd like to jump into questions real quick on this one. Sure. Does anybody have uh, further questions for Vanessa and comments to the group? All right. So, um, anything Not seeing any raised hands or anything. Any questions or, oh, wait, oh, uh, David, David, wait, 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 David Nettenmeyer. Sorry, I cannot raise my hand. Is there a way you can unmute me? Okay, let me un. Uh, yeah, I'll unmute him. Hi, Vanessa. Uh, thanks for the update. I, I really appreciate it. Um, quick question for you: for the uh, homeless encampment that's directly across the street from the Bernal Monterey site under the Bernal Bridge, uh, is the city looking to specifically target those individuals for the housing? at the uh, Bernal Monterey site or the Rue Ferrari site overall? And if so, are they actually going to come back and clean up those sites afterwards too? I'm, I'm, I, I haven't, I've, I've reached out to the office a few times and haven't got a response on that specifically. Um, good question, David. So if, if you watch the council meeting, uh, council member Jimenez has been advocating very strongly for us to um, as most, as best we can given some legal um, limitations that we have uh, to try to focus these sites on um, housing folks that are currently in the district or that live immediately in the area and the unsanctioned encampments. What I can tell you right now is that because of COVID-19, uh, encampment abatement has been uh, stopped. So at this point in time, the, the city and the county are not doing any kind of abatement, but they are, they are doing outreach. They're doing outreach to provide people with information about interim housing solutions that are currently available and also to get people in to the via SPDAT, which is the system that the county uses um, to qualify people for social services such as cash aid, food stamps, um, and affordable housing. So that outreach is happening. There has been a lot of outreach around that particular encampment that you just mentioned on Bernal. 
And that site was actually scheduled for abatement uh, right before the shelter in place order uh, took effect. Um, so the goal is yes, to outreach to the people who live in those areas and to get those people housed and to clean up those encampments. Uh, but because of fair housing rights and limitations, we can't legally prioritize a certain group of people based on their location, their race, their ethnicity, um, or any other geographical or, or um, demographic information. We can't give them priority. Uh, but with that said, we have asked um, our homeless teams to continue outreach to those areas and we will do what we can to make sure that those people in those encampments are aware of, the, of these opportunities because that is the goal. The goal is really to put people in safe housing and to begin to eliminate the unsanctioned encampments that are a sanitary and, and um, uh, unsafe condition for, for not only the people living there but also for the communities, the surrounding communities. Hey David, this is Greg. Uh, when that encampment started developing um, before Captain L. Washburn's uh, tenure here, um, I was in contact with the police department under Captain Tabaldi and talking about that encampment, they uh, routinely kind of go out there and check that place to make sure there's no, uh, nothing um, unlawful going on in terms of the people who are there. So they, they check everyone there. So they, they, it, they do keep an eye off and on as much as they can, but they, they can't just remove them and they'll just end up somewhere else and that's all I want to say about that. That the the, the, uh, the police department is uh, aware of these things. No, I, absolutely, and, and Vanessa, I, I appreciate the update there. Um, I, I think that I think there's just a lot of misconceptions about who's going to be housed at these uh, locations, you know, from yeah. tenant camps and so forth. And everyone has the perception that uh, it's going to be a lot of those individuals that potentially have a lot of issues and they won't be able to support them. Um, you know, it's it's clear that you know they can't really house those people. The mayor specifically said they can't house people against their will. A lot of these people don't want to be housed, and so that's just some of the concerns. Uh, you know, that I'm trying to understand uh, for the group and community that I lead uh, under District Two Acts. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm trying to report back to them. You know, what what's really going on and so forth. And uh, I also did provide um, a breakdown of the FAQ on the website. Um, Vanessa, that I sent to Helen Chapman, she's responded to me. Uh, that they'll get back to me in the mayor's office uh, that to goes into detail and highlights a bunch of areas that are still just uh, really confusing. So uh, I look forward to uh, seeing an update there. I already got a response from Nathan Ho in the mayor's office um, where he said that he will have a second FAQ uh, release overall from, from the city. So I, I look forward to seeing uh, a lot of those concerns addressed. Okay, I see um, uh, Captain Washburn is raising her hand. Uh, Thank you, David. Appreciate it. And then we'll go to Alair after a cap Captain Washburn. Yeah, I just want to say that once the bridge housing is up, should there be an encampment nearby in close proximity where there is known or believed to have criminal activity, that's something I'm not going to tolerate. I mean, certainly there's a process to do outreach, right, to uh, uh, put notice and eventually abate those um, unlawful encampments. Um, and the city has a process for that. But what we can't have is this vulnerable population exposed to criminals. So let's say, for example, someone's using or dealing drugs out of the illegal encampment. We can't have that in close proximity to a vulnerable population that may be otherwise struggling with addiction. So just keep in mind, if those folks don't end up in this bridge housing, that we're going to make sure, to Greg's point, that we're staying present and staying on top of any um, obvious criminal activity, if that makes sense. Yes. And um, Alaire Davidson uh, is asking a, a few questions. Um, why, is this, why is this being built so far from services? How would people access needed services? And why did District 2 get two sites so large? I'm gonna just go one by one and Vanessa let you answer rather than spew you know, all the questions at once. So that's one question. Um, so uh, in terms of access to services, um, these sites were actually analyzed through the Bridge Housing Communities um, assessment that took place in 2017. Um, and they actually ranked really high um, in terms of criteria. And some of that criteria, just off the top of my head, I don't have it in front of me, but was um, setbacks uh, to residential and schools. And it was also access to public transportation and to other services. So um, I know that it seems far away for many people, um, but it, it, it's not that far away. There is a bus line. Um, if you look at the FAQs 
those living in the in the area will be allowed to keep their vehicle on site. They'll have on site parking. So if they have a car, just like you and me, they can drive to and from the grocery store, their doctor's appointments or wherever they need to go. Um, there will also be um, some safety and traffic improvements around the area so people can uh, walk and bike. Um, so these sites were analyzed. That was something that was taken into consideration and these sites were chosen uh, because they were suited for this particular type of housing. And, okay, and oh. the two sites, um, we got two sites because that is what council decided on. Uh, council member Jimenez advocated for limiting it uh, to one site per district and to begin a, a plan for implementation of equitable housing um, solutions across the, um, the district. And unfortunately, his memorandum and motion uh, di did not pass. And that is how things work in a democracy. Um, we tried and we, we did not win that fight. Um, and now we are looking forward, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and making sure that these two sites are well managed, that they're well developed and that successful for the benefit of all of our communities. Okay, and the second part of her question was, um, so for Claire, our homeless problem significantly when the jungle closed and this will push homeless on town. So now. That's so just real quick. Is, is the city going to come out with uh, a way that our, our um, ways that we can provide certain types of services or, um, you know, expertise from the community, whether it be job aids um, or different experiences that my people have? Is there a way that we can uh, set something up where the community can ensure that these are uh, successful sites with the city um, in that way so we can uh, really get together to volunteer together. Um, I can't tell you for sure. What I can tell you though is that, for example, some of our other sites that we have in other places, um, like the Mayberry site um, and some of the other programs that are run by our not partners, they do include partnerships with surrounding communities and they do allow for volunteer opportunities for people who want to get available who, who want to get involved in and and help those that are in those sites um, I know that we are currently looking into um, what's known in San Francisco as a participant stewardship program where the folks who live at the site actually have to commit a certain number of hours a week to the main maintenance and improvement of the site and you know they're required to to um, you know maybe attend for example like a, a job fair um, you know just making sure that resources are available to them uh, but also making sure that the resources that are available to them are integrated into the community so those are definitely things that we're looking at it's kind of hard to do that right now since we don't have a site operator uh, but the site operators in the bay area which is our well-qualified nonprofit organizations that usually apply for these um, usually submit proposals when rfps come out they have a lot more experience than i do um, or than the city does on how to make these sites successful and how to make sure that people are able to transition into permanent housing and that we involve um, the neighborhoods. In terms of volunteering for actually building of the structures like we did for Mayberry, uh, Habitat for Humanity was able to coordinate that effort. I don't think that's going to happen with these sites given the COVID pandemic and the shelter in place order. Okay, we have, we have one more um, question from Albert Ramos. The mayor said the first tiny homes were successful. How can that be determined after a few months? Um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the mayor was referring to. Um, that would be a question that I'm happy to refer to his office. But what I can tell you is that we're continuing to monitor the Mayberry site. Um, and some of, the, some of the ways that we can tell that our sites are successful uh, for example, with our safe parking site, um, some of those measures are how quickly people are able to move into permanent housing, um, how quickly we're able to connect people to resources um, in terms of mental health and, and other social services and public benefits. So there's a lot of measures for success. Um, and so I don't know exactly what the mayor was referring to, but that site is up and running and there are people housed there, which in my opinion is, is success. I would actually like to add a little bit on this. Um, so I went over to visit the Mayberry site and I found the area 
almost spotless <laughs> in the general area. I, I was actually surprised at how clean it was in the area. I actually even saw somebody um, going around picking up garbage. Um, I also reached out to the person who runs the bridge housing, James Stagey, and he told me that um, uh, un, un, misinformation being passed on is that there's only 13 people living there. He said there's more like 36 to 37 people living there or, or have been living there over the, the three or four months that they've been operating and that 12 people have already found permanent housing. And I think that's actually a pretty decent considering, I mean, you know, that maybe when they first opened, they might've had three or four people. Um, and, and then as, as it, you know, got to, you know, they, they um, ramped up on the occupancy. Uh, so, you know, maybe at first they maybe had three, five, six people, and then they went up to about 36, 37, and 12 of those people have been transitioned into permanent housing. Thank you. Did, did the first, did the earlier questioner right before you, Karen, did his answer, his uh, question get answered enough? Do you Are you okay with what Vanessa said? Alaire? Who I mean, was I, that? That was Alaire David, Davidson. So I, I guess Alaire would have to say whether she's satisfied with that answer or not. Okay. I don't see any other questions or uh, hands raised. Great, so if it's okay, Greg, I can move on to the other items that you asked me to update on. Yes, please. Thank you very much for that one. And uh, sure. honored with that project. And I will be going over and talking further to the uh, construction supervisor over there. I met him from Habitat for Humanities. His name is Jim. He, he wants to make that place very successful. And uh, we were talking about a few different things, so. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for that update. Sure, and then the other thing that Greg wanted me to talk a little bit about is Project Turnkey, which is the statewide effort to get um, hotel rooms to house homeless individuals um, so that they're able to safely shelter in place. Um, so San Jose, uh, in, in particular Santa Clara County, is partnering with the state in this effort. Um, and there have been some hotel rooms located um, across the county to house folks. <coughs> I don't have the number of hotel rooms available right now, but I have asked our um, partners at the Emergency Operations Center if they could provide that information to me. And once I have it, I'll share it with you all. <laughs> this is a great program. I think it's a step in the right direction, um, but it is very limited and it's not to scale in terms of um, the homeless problem that exists across the state. Um, and what I know about the rooms that are being utilized in Santa Clara County is that they are currently being utilized for those who are most vulnerable to the disease, not those who have been diagnosed um, positive for the, for the virus. Um, so it's mostly going to rooms for folks who are over 65 or who have chronic conditions. Um, and some of these folks were previously living um, either on the street or were in a shelter and they were moved to a hotel room so that they could safely shelter in place and uh, be uh, socially distanced from others. Um, so that effort is underway, it is happening. Um, we don't see this as an alternative to bridge housing communities. We see this as something that needs to be ha that needs to be happening simultaneously um, so that we can hopefully increase the number of people that we house. Um, and speaking of hotels, just wanted to give you an update. The Wyndham Hotel in District 2, um, which is in South San Jose over on Silicon Valley Boulevard, is currently up for sale. And the city of San Jose is working with the state to see if we can get funds to purchase that hotel um, also for uh, housing needs. Um, that is in the very, very early stages. That's the only information I have regarding the Wyndham at this time, um, but we are looking into it um, and seeing if that would be a location where we could put uh, folks who need shelter. And then um, high-speed rail. Um, if you receive our newsletter, you likely received the update on high-speed rail. Um, on April 24th, there were a few environmental reviews that came out and there's currently an open comment period for the public, um, which will end on June 8th. So the information that was released on the uh, San Jose to Merced line, the Department of Transportation is currently analyzing those reports. Um, specifically, it was a draft environmental impact report and an environmental impact statement. 
Um, our Department of Transportation is reviewing both of those documents and plans on submitting a letter to the High Speed Rail Authority within the next couple of weeks before the June 8th deadline in which they will um, outline their opposition to some of the um, alternatives that are being recommended and in which they will continue to advocate for grade separations um, in South, South San Jose, particularly along Monterey and Branham and some of those other intersections. So we are working on that. If your neighborhood association or neighborhood leadership group would like to submit comments to these reports, we strongly encourage you to do so. I know the NLC or the Leadership Council is working on um, a letter and an official statement. Um, we strongly encourage that. We want to make sure that those folks at the High Speed Rail Authority are aware of our position and we want to make sure that whatever gets put in place is as advantageous as possible uh, for our South Bay communities um, that are impacted by the High Speed Rail Line. So that is a work in progress. Once that letter is available to the public, we will share that with you. Thank you. Questions Vanessa, I'd like to here? throw something into that group here. Um, maybe some people don't know, but I am the chairman of the District 2 Leadership Council, which encompasses about 15 neighborhood associations through District 2. Uh, Silverleaf is one, uh, the one going up for now, I mean, Santa Teresa, Santa Teresa Foothills and so forth. There's about 15 neighborhood associations. We routinely hold meetings and last year, and Karen will help uh, discuss this with me right now. We wrote a letter uh, expressing our desires for the best way to run, that we thought the best way to run this project if it was going to go forward. Um, so a letter was written then and we are in the process, the leadership council group and also a local neighborhood association members are writing with a consultant a letter uh, again during this comment period. So you want to add anything to that, Karen? Yeah, I'll just uh, state. So there's, there's been a, a group of people, most of them from the Metcalf Las Paseas area that have been actively involved in the community working group for high speed rail for about three years. And we've taken every opportunity we can to explain what, you know, what our preference would be if this thing's going to go through. Originally it was a viaduct. Uh, now the preferred alignment is at grade. Uh, through the entire Monterey corridor. Uh, as far from the Los Paseos Metcalf perception, I would say we kind of got what we wanted. Um, we did not want a 90, 80 to 60 to 90 foot viaduct going through our neighborhood. Uh, but now we've really turned our t attention primarily to, to trying to help the people in the northern Monterey corridor who are, uh, who are looking at a potential situation where they have grade crossings that are going to be opening and closing uh, how many trains 167 trains a day greg or something along those lines 176 it probably what? depends yeah then that and that's not even including i don't even think that's including caltrain and and freight so it's it seems untenable to us that uh the area where around skyway chinoweth and branham would would be able to have the high-speed rail go through under these circumstances without the grade separation. So we're we're on board with the city's um, stance that that this area that area needs to be grade separated. Um, so so we're writing a letter with the, the NLC and a few people in our, our neighborhood are writing a letter uh, in response, uh, and we we have a, a person. Uh, John Hessler, who's also a member of a nearby neighborhood association, happens to have a lot of experience with uh, working on EIRs. He's in the transportation industry and his expertise is, is, a, is EIR. So he's, he's helping us get the right language and stuff, um, make sure we are responding the, the way we need to respond to something like this. Uh, so that's kind of what we're doing. We have the what the deadline is early June, and and we're we're working on that right now. And and one of the things that we're proposing is that they do a trench up in that area um, to provide the grade separations. We think that that's the most conducive way to do it. So again, it doesn't as much impact our area. We're we're at grade through the Bernal area. Um, I think the the 
uh, alignment number four, which is the preferred alignment, is planned to go at grade all the way through the entire Monterey corridor, all the way down to Gilroy. So, you know, we, we've kind of gotten what we've wanted for our neighborhood, but uh, we see that there's not a lot of representation up there. And so we've kind of taken that um, under our wing in terms of trying to get uh, some better solutions up there. I just got an input from the Morgan Hill Union School District uh, last week. Also, they are uh, in the process of writing uh, uh, a letter and I see that Mary Patterson just raised her hand. Yes, Mary, <laughs> oh, let me unmute her. Mary, go ahead. Thanks, Karen. Hey, Mary. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, um, just so everybody knows, um, the you know, the Morgan Hill Unified School District serves all the public school students, most of the public school students in Los Paseos, neighborhood, California, Maison, maybe the Metcalf area, Coyote Ranch, et cetera. And then um, west of Santa Teresa Boulevard too, of course, south of Brunel. And so um, just so you know, we're also writing a letter to protest the preferred alignment for the Los Paseos kids that travel by bus to Sobrato High School, for example, for the Morgan Hill kids that travel by bus to Martin Murphy and Los Paseos. We, um, the district estimates that 48 bus routes will be disrupted by the high-speed rail trains in the current at-grade alignment proposal every morning. So it's a huge disruption to our students who go back and forth. So just want everybody to know that. So Mary, what are you guys proposing then? Um, because we need to get on board, you know, because that basically puts us in conflict with you guys, you know, in, in a sense. If you're if you're if you're protesting the ad grade and we're basically and we're okay with the ad grade, yeah. Are you talking about more further beyond Los Those, dis you know, those disruptions, kind of Karen, are to the south, right? Because okay. buses use the Brunel Road overcrossing, okay. and then the next place, and then the buses are on Santa Teresa Boulevard, but. Um, the buses also go down Monterey Highway mm -hmm. at some of those lights and then all the way down through Morgan Hill. So most of the impact is in Morgan Hill. And um, I mean, I think for Morgan Hill lights, it's going to be, you know, the alternative four is much, much preferred, if I understand correctly. Oh, and no, so that's, the one, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, so that's the, the one. The, the number four is the one that's preferred by us, too. That's the at grade, though. I'm sorry, the one that runs along the free, around okay. along Highway 101, is that great? Yeah, that's, a, I, I can't remember what number that is. So that is a little bit, uh, yeah. And, and you know, honestly, we don't, we don't, we're not as concerned what, ha I mean, I don't want to say we're concerned what, not concerned what happens after Las Paseos. Uh, we, we are, you know, we want to take it in, in consideration the environmental impacts, the native wildlife corridor, and what you're saying. Right. Um, we're going to be uh, combining and collaborating with uh, you a little bit, Mary, on this whole yeah, thing. Yeah, we, we uh, should. I, I talked to uh, John Hessler, knows about your letter that the Morgan Hill School District is writing. So Great. in the next week, he's pretty busy right now, but in, next week, uh, maybe we'll be touching base with you. Okay. Sounds yeah, we want, we want to have a little bit more of a coordinated effort. We don't want to say anything that's going to impact you guys that we don't want to impact you guys, and we don't want you guys to say anything that's going <laughs> to send a viaduct star way, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it'd be yeah. nice to at least get a better, you know, on, make sure we're on the same page. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Are thank there you. any, thank you very much, Mary, for raising your hand. I, th I see one more uh, from Vandana Dandu. For San Jose to Merced route, do we have a route map and what are the timelines for this project construction? Uh, Greg, do you? Um, who is that asking? Bandana Dandu. What I can do is, um, yes, we have a route map that we can sh share with you. Um, I will put it out. Are you on my uh, email list? Actually not. <laughs> I don't think, yeah. Van Vandana, if you would, uh, did you see uh, the email regarding uh, sending a note to treasurer at lospaseosneighbors.com? Um, no, so is that the email address that I should be reaching out? Yes. Okay, sorry. Can you repeat um, one more time the email address? Yes, uh, treasurer. Mm -hmm. 
I'll type yeah. it. Okay, sure. In the chat. <laughs> okay. So we'll get you. Uh, we'll get everybody on my email list a route map the, the proposal from the EIR. I sent out a uh, the entire EIR with some very good information in it uh, about a week or so ago, and I'll resend that again. That'd be helpful. Thanks, Greg. Hey, Greg, is it org or com? Treasure.com. Com. Com. Yes. Okay. And does and, it also include the timelines in the construction? All, all those details? You know, are... that that's kind of, I mean, they, they have a, they have a, <laughs> if everything goes according to plan, which it obviously isn't. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how. It I don't could know be how 20, uh, it could be 2030. Uh, they're already doing some electrification up north of us. Mm -hmm. But I'll get that all to you uh, in an email. Okay, so I'm going to reach out to the email that Karen just sent in the chat, and you can just yeah, yeah. right. Could, and, could and you, I think uh, re, could you Greg, repeat I the just... email, Vandana? Repeat the email. Treasure R at lostpassionsneighbors.com. Yeah, that's yeah, in treasure, the chat. Tre treasurer, treasurer, the, yeah. treasurer with the E R on the end. Right. It, it's the cor it's the correct email address. I put it in the chat, Greg. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Greg, also, if I could just jump in really quickly, the High Speed Rail Authority staff is answering questions via public access webinars, and there's going to be one on the 18th, yes. um, Monday, and so you can you can visit um, the High Speed Rail Authority website and get that information on how to join these webinars, and you can also see uh, different FAQs and maps and things that have been put out. Uh, by the high-speed rail authority on their website. Okay. Okay, and I see another question from Al Albert Ramos. Can I ask about the Wyndham Hotel? What type of housing is the city contemplating in that area? I'm not sure if he's talking about the Rue Ferrari site, if, is that, if that's what he means. Um, I think he's probably referring to the, the potential purchase of the Wyndham Hotel. So the city has been looking at hotels to purchase um, and either to renovate or to use uh, for housing uh, people who need housing. So at this point in time, that's the only information that I have available. Um, I can tell you that currently through our, our current motel voucher program, where we contract with Life Moves, um, that program is focused on families and helping families who are homeless uh, to get a temporary roof over their head as they wait for affordable housing to become available. So it would be something of that nature where we are able to um, house folks who need it. Sorry, how is that been done? Um different compared to the Rue Ferrari housing? Is it more of a temporary at the Windham? Yeah, it's, well, um, I think it's, these are all interim housing solutions that are happening concurrently. Um, and it really just depends on, um, you know, what space is available and how quickly we can get people housed. The motel voucher program is very limited. And to be honest, it's not very cost effective. Um, it costs a lot of money to put people in hotel rooms um, just because of the costs. And most hotels are privately owned for-profit businesses. So it's difficult to do arrangements with them that are um, economically uh, But we have been doing that on a limited basis for families through our motel voucher program. And then um, just to wrap up my update, I wanted to remind everyone that the census is very important. The census determines the amount of federal funding that we receive as a county and as a city. And it's very, very important that everybody complete that. So if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to do so and to tell your neighbors and to remind your friends uh, to complete the census. Everyone counts and we need these numbers um, to continue receiving assistance in our communities. And then lastly, I just wanted to give a quick COVID-19 update. The city of San Jose has an emergency operations center that is coordinating with the county uh, during the shelter in place order and pandemic. Um, we at the city do not have health experts. Um, the county does. And so the county is where the limitations or the activities um, that are permitted are decided. That is all happening through Dr. Cody and her team of health experts. However, the city is involved and we're coordinating with them uh, for a potential plan to reopen. Uh, but of course, we are on standby for their, um, for their advice on when that would be safe. In the meantime, City Hall remains closed to the public. Many of our offices are providing limited services and some departments are providing limited services, but until the shelter in place order is lifted, we do not, um, we will not 
be providing um, homeless abatement services or parking enforcement unless those are emergency situations where it's a health or safety hazard. The same goes for code enforcement. So uh, folks can still contact us. You can still submit reports. You can still um, submit reports on abandoned vehicles and code violations, but unless it's an immediate um, a situation that's going to impact public health or safety, it will not be addressed until City Hall is fully operational. And that depends on when the county decides to lift the shelter in place order. Um, and you should know that yesterday during the rules committee meeting, uh, Councilmember Jimenez and Vice Mayor Jones put forth a memorandum recommending the um, use of face masks in all public spaces in San Jose. And that item will come before the city council in the next couple of weeks and they will decide uh, whether or not we are going to mandate that as a city. We've received many calls and emails from concerned residents who would like to see a, a San Jose mandate on masks uh, for the protection and safety of everyone. Um, and lastly, I am going to be going away on maternity leave as of June 1st, and for Los Paseos, uh, Laura Nguyen, um, who is our communications and community outreach um, staffer, will be the temporary liaison for the Neighborhood Association in my absence. So if you have any questions on COVID-19 shelter in place order, the city's role in that effort, or um, on this census, please let me know. So I see a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to actually go a little bit out of order. Um, so Kalpana, don't worry, I will get back to your question. But since uh, Vanessa just started, so was finished talking about the census, I'm going to go to Mary Patterson. And um, Vanessa, the question from Mary is, when will census takers start going do door to door? Seems like an essential function. And this is a good time to find people at home and assist them with surveys. Do you know anything about that? I, I can't answer that for sure, but I do know that that hasn't happened because of the requirement for social distancing, and it's just not something that I think is safe. Um, even um, at this point in time, going and knocking on someone's door or leaving your house for something like this isn't considered an essential service in Santa Clara County, um, but we will have to see. Um, we'll have to see what happens. I can check in with our census team at the city. Um, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. I know there have been some extensions to the census, which may happen again. Um, but yeah, as of right now, the easiest way to fill out the form is to either complete the form that comes in your mailbox or to go online and complete the form. It's very simple. It takes less than five minutes. Um, and every single person in your household who lives there should be, should be included and counted. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to go back to Kalpana. She's asking a question regarding back to the homeless or the Wyndham. What is the criteria to house homeless and Wyndham if that goes through? Um, I've seen articles where city provides low dose drugs for homeless that are drug addicts and are housed in hotels. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that question. As I mentioned previously, the purchase of the Wyndham is in the very, very early stages. Uh, we would have to work with the state to get sufficient funds to be able to, to purchase a building of that size and that cost. So it's just something that we're looking into, um, what the details would be in terms of the um, criteria or, or, or who it would manage it. Those are all um, details that we're not even, we're not there yet. We don't even know if we have enough money um, to, buy the, to buy the building. But once that information becomes available, we would um, obviously provide that to the community as soon as it, it is available. Okay, and Captain- so Vanessa, Vanessa Cap excuse oh. me. Vanessa, as soon as that is available, can you get the answer to this question? Uh, if it's gonna proceed forward, what type, what type of uh, person goes in there? The, the answer to the question, well, um, can it I be? Think, I think it'll definitely come in stages, Greg. This is definitely more of a long-term effort. I don't see this happening overnight. Um, yeah. Uh, because of the 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 city would is our first priority is to secure the funds and so what's okay. once funds are secured then we could um see what, what would come next yeah thank you okay and then um captain washburn i think she's addressing the part about the low dose drugs so she said to her knowledge the city does not provide drugs to residents people may get treatment through the county and some may get opiate alternatives such as methadone but don't know if it's still used but any distribution of controlled substances is illegal at a state and federal level. 
She also added that you can answer the census questions very easily on the internet in less than five minutes. And she left the, for those of you who asked, uh, somebody asked, uh, Kalpana asked about the link to the online census and uh, Captain Washburn uh, put it in the chat. So um, Kalpana or anybody else that's interested, please look in the chat and the link is there. Thank you, Captain Washburn. Thank you, Captain. Yes, thank you. Yes, Vanessa, congratulations and all the best to you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone on the call for your continued leadership and for just continuing to stand up and support your communities. It's definitely something that um, our office and the council member very much appreciate. Um, Greg and Karen, you've been amazing. Herb as well um, in providing information to your, uh, to your residents and to folks through LPNA and through the NLC. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing, even in this trying time. Um, and so my last day at the office will be June 1st, actually technically May 30th, um, but I will be available until then. And then my team is obviously going to be available to you all afterwards. Laura will be your direct contact for LPNA um, and she can, you know, connect you to resources and information. All right. Thank you. We know Laura. So thank you very much. Vanessa, that, congratulations. We'll miss you. We'll miss you very yes, much. Yes, we will. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Um, I think that concludes our agenda. And if there's anything else from the audience, uh, please raise your hand. Or chat. Or chat. So thank you all for coming, really, um, sincerely. We uh, appreciate updating you and, and hope it's been beneficial. And I would like to know and get feedback from you if you could uh, let us know what you thought about this and also um, what you would like to see further done for uh, Los Paseos neighborhood. And uh, if, if we have to do it this way again at the next meeting, we'll uh, look forward to meeting you again, same way. We'll I get probably a, a little bit better each time. <laughs> <laughs> Smita was raising her hand, I think, or were you waving? I was raising my hand just to say thank you. I'm really impressed with what an informative meeting this was and how you managed to get all the questions in. And so thank you for having this and giving us a chance mm. to Talk to welcome. Captain Washburn. And, and thank you, and thank you, Karen, for <coughs> being co-host and monitoring the questions. That that helped the flow of the meeting go much better. No problem. Yeah. All right, y'all. Yeah. Thanks for all of you. It Have was a good night. Fun. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Let us know. Let us know what you thought of the meeting. Thank you. Bye bye. Good meeting. Thank you, Captain Washburn. Thank you. Good night. Now, I don't know if you want to know, but there is a way. I am going to end the meeting. Bye, Greg. Bye. See you. Bye. See you, Michael. <laughs>